Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning study, last morning study for this week. Uh, before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? The dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the time that we have each morning. And we invite your spirit's presence into our hearts, into our minds. We know, Lord, that uh, you have been teaching us from Daniel's last vision. And um, we pray, Lord, that the things, the lessons that we are learning about ourselves, about how to understand truth and to share the gospel with others, that they can be um, understood more thoroughly and exercised in our lives. We pray for each person that you can bless them and that you can strengthen them. Help each of us, Lord, to trust fully in you. Be with us now through thy spirit. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning again. It's nice to see everyone. Some people that are usually here aren't here, but uh, some people that are sometimes here are, are here. And uh, I know many people watch these videos. Um, some people can't be here at this time of day. Now, I have a feeling this would probably be the last study on Daniel's last vision unless something else comes up. So what we have been addressing um, for the last while has been the endorsement of Ellen White, of Uriah Smith's thoughts on Daniel and Revelation, and how that endorsement is to be understood in regard to whether we accept everything in that book as being somehow inspired or correct. And so one of the ways we looked at that is we addressed other endorsements. So yesterday and the day before, we dealt with Ellen White's endorsement of Crozier's article in the Day Star of February 7th, 1846. And we could see that there's things there that would be questionable as being true. So some of his arguments, uh, we would say, well, they're, they're not correct. And yet Ellen White endorsed that. So we would say, well, she endorses some of the ideas, um, the 2300 days, and of course, uh, Christ's ministry in the heavenly sanctuary, et cetera. Um, now here, this, this endorsement is maybe not as clear to some, but there are many people who take some of these statements regarding the midnight cry that we're going to look at here as an endorsement of uh, the true midnight cry that was given by Samuel Snow in the summer of 1844. Now, so this is probably the strongest of all of the statements. So this is from early writings, uh, the chapter entitled The Second Angel's Message, and, and it's actually Spiritual Gifts as well, volume one. Right. So uh, you can find it there. But I just have it here. So as the churches refused to receive the first angel's message, they rejected the light from heaven and fell from the favor of God. They trusted to their own strength by opposing the first message and by opposing the first message, placed themselves where they could not see the light of the second angel's message. But the beloved of God who were oppressed accepted the message, Babylon is fallen and left the churches. So there's a number of things here. Of course, we know about the first, second, and third angel's message, that you can't have a third without the first and the second. We know that these messages have their place, and we not to remove a peg or a pin of these messages, that they have their proper place. And um, we know that the, in the first message, the group that's going to be tested are Protestants. They're going to be tested by that message. And, and many people rejected that message. And, and some, some after, you know, they're tested, they're going to be tested with the first disappointment. And, and so even though they may have accepted the message for a time, they're going to fall away. So some people, because they, Opposed, obviously, if, if you oppose the first message, you couldn't have accepted the second angel's message. So it says, near the close of the second angel's message, I saw a great light from heaven shining upon the people of God. The rays of this light seemed bright as the sun, and I heard the voices 
of angels crying, behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Oh, and in, in the previous paragraph, notice that there is uh, the first part of the second angel's message is the message Babylon is fallen. Right. So the beloved of God who were oppressed accepted the message Babylon is fallen. And um, in the three angels messages source book, uh, I I take different I choose I chose different articles uh, to put in that source book regarding the first angel's message and the second angel's message. And so there's definitely a section there dealing with uh, the part that Babylon has fallen, how they came to understand the Protestant churches were Babylon. And, uh, and then of course, the message of the midnight cry itself. So the midnight cry I see is separate to some degree from the second angel's message. It, it's, it's, it's part of it, but it's this particular part of it dealing with Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Where the second angel's message we normally see as Babylon is fallen. A- any questions about that idea? Well, on the first far, you do seem to be separate messages. You wouldn't really naturally connect them to each other, I think. Right, because one is one is based on the parable of the ten virgins, and the other is is in Revelation 14, right? So when you look at Revelation 14, you don't see the parable of the ten virgins. But in Millerite history, we put these two together. There, there's a lot to it, and, we, and, and I've done some studies on it. Uh, but the idea that we have about the repetition of the first, second, and third angels' messages, in our time, we have a statement in the Spirit of Prophecy where she talks about uh, the parable of the ten virgins has been fulfilled and will be fulfilled to the very letter. And, and often we just sort of take that and superimpose that over top of the first, second, and third angels' messages. But in reality, she makes a statement regarding about the repetitions of the messages, and then she makes a statement regarding the repetition of the parable of the ten virgins. And so we can put them together because they exist together in Millerite history, but they are separate messages, right? Babylon is fallen, is fallen second ages message and behold the bridegroom cometh go ye out to meet him and even within millerite history they are separate ideas they just come together in that history right so the midnight cry is is a part of the second angel's message but it's not explicitly mentioned as part of the second angel's message in revelation 14 it just becomes that through what ended up happening in millerite history any any thoughts about that? I mean, so Stephen had some thoughts. Anyone else? If Stephen has more thoughts, it's fine too. Because I, I think that's always been a part of con- a confusion within the movement. Another thing that we see as a confusion within the movement has to do with the rep- repetition of the seven thunders. And so lots of times, because it was taught in the movement, that the seven thunders are repeated. And, and I've made the argument going back to 2018 when I wrote a paper on it, um, that the seven thunders are not repeated, that they're unsealed, which is different. That is our understanding of Millerite history is unsealed in our time, but the thunders themselves are not seven events. It has to do with a sealing up of Millerite history that's unsealed in our movement. And whether that's seven, seven events in our movement that unseals the, the way marks in Millerite history, we, we've never really fully examined. We've never, I don't think that we've fully gone through uh, that study. We probably should at some point do a series on the seven thunders. Um, Because I think it's something that's created confusion within this movement. So anyway, that's sort of an aside to what we're looking at. But I I think it's important to to discuss here because of of what we're reading. Okay, so Ellen White says, this was the midnight cry, referring to, behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Which was to give power to the second angel's message. So you can see here the midnight cry is the empowerment of the second angel's message. 
So when we look at the first angel's message, what was the empowerment of the first angel's message? The restraint of Islam on the 11th of August, 1840. Yeah, so the end of the second woe, which, you know, so if we think about it, that's that's really a separate prophecy. Like we, we don't see an explicit connection in in scripture regarding the first angel's message and its empowerment having to do with Revelation 9, right? But we see that, that those these messages, in a sense, overlap or are interentwined, or entwined, I guess. They don't need to be interentwined, but they're entwined with each other, right? They're all fit together, all of these prophecies of scripture. So we have this tapestry of prophecy that has been woven, this what we call the structure of prophetic chronology is how I like to say it anyway. That, that each of these prophecies, all these prophecies of scripture uh, come together. They're, they're interconnected. They're not just separate. And, and so when we see uh, what happens with the empowerment of the first angel, that it comes from this prophecy of Revelation 9, which is going to confirm the year-day principle. So that means you have a message that's given. It's going to have a formalization and then an empowerment. And, and that empowerment, just as you have a period of darkness, you have an arrival of a message. And with, with every message, there's always a period of darkness, even with the second message or the third message. There's always something that that message is going to address. There comes a formalization of that message. That message is now put into a form that it can be presented. And then as it's presented, something occurs that's going to empower that message. So here we're going to have this parable of the ten virgins is going to be tied to the second angel's message because it's going to empower the second angel's message. I think with the first angel's message, you have maybe a bit more of a link because of that year-day principle being confirmed. Because with that first angel's message, you had that prophecy, the 2,300 days. Okay. And so you have a time prophecy with that uh, being empowered with the 181 years and a half, a month, whatever. So I think there's a wee bit more of a connection there between the first angel's message and its empowerment. While okay. the second angel's message, maybe not so. Well, maybe there's something that, that we need to notice about these messages to see how how more how they're connected. And Possible, yes. Okay. So so if we think about what was the darkness that preceded the arrival of the second angel's message. So so what was that darkness? So we had the first angel's message. That darkness had to do with uh, the light on the scriptures, right? We, so we know that the scriptures are going to be opened up. The understanding of of time prophecies, of the messages of Revelation, the book of Daniel being unsealed. So so that's going to be uh, dealing with the first angel's message. And we see in the book of Revelation, not in chapter 14, but in uh, chapter 10, we're going to see this little book unsealed, right? So we have some very specific prophecies that show the unsealing of the book of Daniel. And... Um, and then so in, in Revelation chapter 10, you're going to have this, this period of time represented from the time of the end until uh, the time appointed, right? That, that period of 46 years from 1798 to 1846 is going to be represented in Revelation 10. So that's the, in the first angel's message. Now, what about with the second angel's message? What what is then the darkness? Now that's that's also going to be there in Revelation ten. So it's kind of well, you have what do you mean? Maybe the disappointment, the bitterness. Okay, so the disappointment, right? So so we can see because the seven thunders sealed up are sealed up, right? The voice, whatever the seven thunders uttered, is sealed up. That is the thing that's going to be dark, right? But so it's not so their disappointment is not going to be understood, right? It's not explicitly stated there. Because if they knew of their disappointment, then they wouldn't have been disappointed, right? You understand what I'm saying? 
so the tearing time is is the thing that we would look at and so we can see that there must be a tarrying time in the second angel's message, right? We can see that Habakkuk chapter two, which of course is second angel's message. So, so this tarrying time, so the light that comes then, what is the light of the midnight cry that answers to the tarrying time? Because if we understand what that darkness is, then we can understand why this, this midnight cry message is given. Does that, that make sense? Yeah, I think so. Okay. So so we, the tearing time is built into the second angel's message. And the midnight cry is answering that question. So there is something that you need the midnight cry for, just inherent in the second angel's message itself. Now, we say, well, the second angel's message is Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Right. So you can say, well, how do you connect then? Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Right. So that that would sort of be the question. But we can see when we deal with this Babylon is fallen, is fallen. When we deal with the, the topic of these prophecies, these time prophecies, as we see in Habakkuk chapter two, you know, write the vision, make it plain upon tables. Right. So we have these these time prophecies which are going to end in that period. There is this inherent tarrying time. And so the parable of the 10 virgins addresses that tarrying time. So there's, there's hopefully that, that helps a little bit that we can see that this is sort of necessary. Now it says, uh, so this midnight cry was to give power to the second angel's message. That's its purpose. Angels were sent from heaven to arouse the discouraged saints and prepare them for the great work before them. So we can see, just as with the first angel's message, where, where God sent his angel to William Miller, we see that angels are sent from heaven to arouse the discouraged saints and prepare them for the great work before them. So we see that God is, is part of the second angel's message, right? He's involved in it. Now, it says the most talented men were not the first to receive this message. Now, who first receives this message? Well, Samuel Snow gets the message. Yeah, so he, he gets the message, right? So if it says angels were sent to the humble, devoted ones and constrained them to raise the cry, we can see that that would include Samuel Snow and the others who were around him. So Samuel Snow is going to become the central figure. Ellen White never mentioned Samuel Snow. Right. As a person, um, you can maybe say Mrs. Couch was the first to receive it. Yeah, you could say. But, you know, we also know that um, uh, Brother Southern, Southern, is that his name? That that Snow writes to. So there's there's people that he has been communicating with that appear to receive this message. We all know Sister Minor. She also has accepted this message. So she was involved in, in it as well. So, so there were people connected with, with Samuel Snow. But yeah, so his sister. But, but the point is, we can see that this is uh, angels were sent to humble devoted ones and constrain them to raise the cry, behold, the bridegroom cometh go ye out to meet him. And those entrusted with the cry made haste and in the power of the Holy Spirit sounded the message and aroused their discouraged brethren. The work did not stand in the wisdom and learning of men, but in the power of God. And his saints who heard the cry could not resist it. The most spiritual received this message first, and those who had formerly led in the work were the last to receive and help swell the cry. Now, you know, this sort of statement saying that those that received this were the most spiritual and the ones who had formerly led in the work then would not have been the most spiritual. If that, I don't know if we can read into it exactly that way. Um, now, of course, you know, trying to decide who's spiritual and more spiritual or most spiritual, I'm, I'm not sure particularly what that means. But there were some who were at least more open to receive this message than others. And, and the ones that were less open were ones who had formerly led in the work. They're going to be the last to receive it and, and to, to help in the swelling of a loud cry. Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. So 
Can we say that this is an endorsement of the message of the midnight cry in that it's sent from angels, that it's, it's, um, it's not the wisdom and learning of men, but it's the power of God. Would, would we imply then that what Samuel Snow presented came from God and not from Samuel Snow? Is that how we would uh, read this paragraph? I can agree with that. Yeah. So, so we can say this is an endorsement of the message. I would say in some ways this is a stronger endorsement than Ellen White's endorsement of thoughts on Daniel and Revelation, right? Because this is not just, you know, here is a good book. It's got helping hand. You know, it's going to do a good work. It should be sold and so forth. She is saying this is the midnight cry that was given to empower the second angel's message. And, and angels from heaven are involved in this, right? And that it's, it's not even the work of man. It's not the wisdom of man or the learning of man, but it's the power of God, right? So can people agree with me that this is even a stronger endorsement of the midnight cry than Ellen White's endorsement of Smith's thoughts on Daniel and Revelation? Can, can I make that statement? Could we agree with that? Or at least it's as much an endorsement. It would appear that way. Yeah. Agreed. Amen. Yeah. So it's not it's not a weak endorsement, right? It, 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 it's a pretty strong endorsement of that message, which is what we're going to look at. Now, I have run into people who have said, because of this endorsement of the Midnight Cry by Ellen White, that we need to accept everything that was that was part of the Midnight Cry, especially what was published on August 22nd, or yeah, August 22nd in 1844. That is the paper called The True Midnight Cry, right? So uh, just show you this here first. So here is uh, the publication, The True Midnight Cry, right? So this is going to be published on August 22nd. It's also going to be republished, I, I think, October 7th or something like that. But But so we know a week after Samuel Snow did his three presentations, so on August 15th, which happens to be the date today. Um, let's see. Uh, but uh, when the midnight cry was given, uh, so so I guess that would be a uh, hundred and, uh, what's that, 180 years ago, All right? That... Uh, August 15th, 1844, that the Midnight Cry was given. Samuel Snow did his three presentations. Yes. It was a while ago. Okay. So we just happened to be. This wasn't planned. I never really thought about it till just this moment. Um, so, but anyway, you, you know, we can see that 180 years ago today, the Midnight Cry was empowered. And we know it was first given also on July 21st in Boston. And that's the event where Samuel Snow rides up on the horse, which which uh, Lothborough conflates, conflates these two events. So he puts Exeter in July instead of in August. But, but anyway, we know that it's going to be based on uh, eyewitness testimony, that of Joseph Bates and James White, uh, that it's going to be on August 15th that the three presentations are given by Snow. And, and then a week later, it's going to be published. So this, I, I believe this would basically be what he presented on August 15th. Now, I'm not going to read it from here because it's just a little uh, dark to read. So I have it here in the Three Angels Messages source book. And you can see here we have the True Midnight Cry. Um, this is the paper just printed out, a little bit easier to read. And um, he's going to, you know, give sort of an introduction. And then he's going to outline outline and go through his arguments for the the prophetic periods to end in the fall or the autumn of 1844 rather than in the spring right so that's we're not going to read everything in detail now the first thing that he presents as an argument is the 6000 years so he says, the period of time allotted for this world in its present state 
is 6,000 years, at the termination of which commences the great millennial Sabbath spoken of in Revelation 20, and which will be ushered in by the personal appearing of Christ in the first resurrection. According to Usher's chronology, which is commonly received, the Christian era commenced in the year of the world in 404. But Usher has lost the, in the time of the judges 153 years from the division of the land of Canaan to the beginning of Samuel's administration. He gives about 295 years. Now, Stephen can easily point out some of the problems here of what he's actually saying. Um, whereas Paul in Acts uh, 13, verse 20, gives us about the space of 450. From the book of Judges, we obtain 430 years, and Josephus gives us 18 more for the elders in anarchy before any judge ruled. This added to 430 makes 448, which agrees with Paul, supposing him to have spoken in round numbers. The difference between this time and that given by Asher is 153 years and should be added to the age of the world, making for the commencement of the Christian era in 4157 BC, or in other words, 4,156 and a fraction had passed at the supposed point of the birth of Christ. Deducing this from 6,000 years, the remainder is 183 and a fraction. Therefore, the period will end in AD 1844. So there's all kinds of mistakes being made here. So what are some of the first mistakes that he makes? There's probably about a half a dozen mistakes here. But uh, the, one of the mistakes, of course, is now we would agree that there's a 6,000 years dealing in, in the Bible. But does that go from the creation of the world or from the, the origin of sin? That, that when man first sinned. Is there 6,000 years of sin or 6,000 years from creation to the second coming? Right. Good point. 6,000 years of sin. Yes. So that's how Ellen White puts it. Well, I would say I would be more of a, a ballpark figure. Um, 6,000 years of sin? Yes. Well, it could be. We don't know. I mean, it, it could be that it's, it's going to be exactly 6,000 years because we don't know when man sinned. Right. We don't know how long after the creation of Adam and Eve they sinned. I, I haven't been able to find anything in the spirit of prophecy that says like it was soon after the creation or anything like that. Definitely not in the Bible that doesn't give us this information. Probably so wasn't it, long after creation. Probably well, wasn't we too long after creation. How do you know? Well, because they were to uh, appropriate, fill the earth. Um, yes. So uh it should have been long after that whenever yeah. but but that that would just be an inference. We don't know exactly how long it is, right? The Bible doesn't tell us, Ellen White doesn't tell us. Now, you know, so some people put it like seven years after, but yeah. but we don't know. And 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 it could be just a ballpark figure, it could be just a rounded number. But, but we don't know. But some people argue that that you know there was actually 6000 years from creation to October 22nd 1844 because that's what's in here okay okay so we got um, so that would be the first thing is you know is this 6000 years supposed to be from creation or is it from the origin of sin is it an exact number is it a round number Ellen White, when she talks about 6000 years she will talk about it's more than 6000 years since uh, the origin of sin as far as Satan is concerned. So for more than 6,000 years, Satan has been doing this or whatever. But she'll sometimes talk about it's nearly 6,000 years. And so, you know, is she contradicting herself or is she talking about two different uh, periods of 6,000 years, right? Um, so, or, and sometimes she'll just say four or 6,000 years. So sometimes she'll say more than, sometimes less than, sometimes she'll say just 6,000 years. So I, I've done a, a, a detailed study on her 6,000 year statements. That's what I presented in 2014. That's part of what I presented at the camp meeting in Arkansas on October 20th, 2014. So so in addressing this 6,000 years, there are different opinions. Some people stick to what it says here, but that must be the case. 
And so they want to have uh, this 153 years added to the chronology. So we know this, this is actually Miller's chronology, where he's going to add 153 years to Usher's. Now, some interesting details. We know that Usher is going to have, so Usher believes that the Jews use a 360-day uh, year with five days added uh, every year, so that there's 30-day months. That's what Usher believed the Jews used prior to the Exodus. So Usher believes that the Jews were using basically an Egyptian calendar that was adjusted to the solar year. So his basis for that, I haven't been able to find a, a basis for it, but that's an assumption that he makes. Now, just like many chronologists that I've read and studied, when they're going to create a chronology, they start with some assumptions. They start with some presuppositions. And Asher actually began with the belief that there was 4,000 years from the creation of the world to the birth of Christ, right? So he's, he's, he's going to place the birth of Christ in 4 BC. And so he wants the creation of the world in 4004. That is, he's already has this as an established point that he's trying to prove. So many people may not be aware of that, right? So he has a system in which he's going to get things to fit a particular way. And, and so one of his assumptions that he also has is that, that the, year, the Jewish year is going to begin in the fall with the autumnal equinox. So it's just an assumption he makes. It's not something that he can prove, but he believes that that's how they would start their year and start their count. Okay, so he's not going to have them starting their count in the spring. He's going to have them starting their count in the fall prior to the Exodus. And that it's going to be uh, the first day of, you know, Tishri, right? It's not going to be called the seventh month. I guess you could call it the first one. And, and I think that's how he actually understands uh, uh, the flood, too, is that it's from fall to fall. But. Don't quote me on that one. Um, but anyway, he's going to have this year start in the fall. And Theodore? Yeah. Don't we had a date of uh, the date when uh, they give a cry on Adam? The what? When, when he had his first son. Don't they give a how many years he was born? Yeah. How many years alive when he, uh, his first son born, was born? No. You, you got a date on it, ain't you? No. We don't know how old uh, Adam and Eve were when uh, um, Cain was born. And we don't know, right? We know Cain is the first son, right? Uh, we don't even know if he's the first child, because they could have had daughters first. But we know for sure he's the first son. But we're only going to know that he had Seth, or not Seth, uh, yeah, Seth, that's right. Seth, when he was 130. Right? Right, Stephen? Am I correct on that? No, I don't think so. Okay. So, so anyway, with, with Usher, because he starts with this assumption, he, he's going to find some coincidences that actually help convince him of this. So one is he has to have uh, this, the autumnal equinox fall on the first day of the week, right? Now, the chances of that happening is one in seven in any, in any year. So if you take a year and you, you're you going to look at the autumnal equinox, it's only going to fall on the first day of the first month, one in seven times, right? Because there's seven days in a week, okay? Now, it just so happens that the autumnal equinox falls on the right day of the week, in 440 BC. So this was for Usher. This would have been one of the confirmations that he was correct in choosing 404 BC, right? Because if it had fallen on a Wednesday, then he couldn't have chosen 404 BC as the year of creation if the autumnal equinox was the start of the year. So, so it just so happened that that worked out for him. 
Does that make sense to people? People not understand that? I mean, I can show you how that works. You have like a line for that? Well, what I can show you here is um, this. So this is uh, Skyview Cafe. Okay, so if we go back into the past here, so it, it's, uh, whoops, I did it wrong way, 403. Okay, so you're going to see this is 404 BC. And here you're going to have this over here. I don't know if you can see that. It says the, the fall equinox. And this is, here, I got this set for the Duke here. I'm going to change this to, uh, I'm going to change this to Jerusalem. So I guess I don't know why it's not defaulting there. Just so we got the Middle East there. Okay. So I'm going to save that. Make that the default location. There we go. Okay. So you can see here we got these. This is the month of October. And see how October 22nd, you're going to have the autumnal equinox, the fall equinox. And, and the way this is set up, I don't know why it's set up this way, because it's got Saturday here. But you can see the next day is Sunday. So uh, I have to read. I don't know why the settings went back. Um, and I know how to change it, but I can't remember. So that's better. So you can see October 22nd, that's going to be a Saturday. That's going to be the autumnal equinox at 7.46 p.m. So Usher is going to say, the 23rd of October is going to be the first day of creation. And it's going to begin at sunset on October 22nd, 404 BC. Does that make sense? Can you see that more clearly now? Is that... Yeah, a little more clear. Yeah, so, okay. So so that happened to work out for Usher. Now, if you added 153 years to this, you would have, you, you would have, um, so this is the year of creation that that Usher had, right? And you're going to see that um, the Antalmo Equinox is going to fall on the 23rd of October in 4157 BC. And so that would make, uh, if you followed Usher's logic, the first day of creation would be a Saturday, right? So it doesn't work. And, and it's going to be the 24th of October. So some people just think you can add the 153 years and you're going to have the world created in 4157 BC on October 22nd. Right. But yeah. that doesn't work. Right. Because yeah. the, see, it's see, it on, work. yeah, it's going to fall on different days of the week. Um, and also as you, as you go through time, because this is a Julian calendar, uh, the autumnal equinox is going to drift. Like right now, the autumnal equinox is like September 20th. Here, back in the past, it would be October 23rd on the Julian. And an even different date on the Gregorian, well, on the Gregorian, it'd be more like September 20th or 21st, right, still. So, so the Gregorian and Julian have basically, they're a month different in this period of time. Okay. So I know that can be confusing for some people who don't understand these calendars, but they drift. Some people think they're always 10 days apart, uh, but right now they're 13. It's just, they, you know, and believe me, I've run into people writing books, scholars who don't understand the Julian and Gregorian calendars who are trying to deal with chronology. So anyway, we, we, we can see here that it doesn't just, not just as simple as that. So, so I sure had this confirmation regarding his dates. So that means when he was going through his chronology, he wanted things to fit so that he had 4004 BC. Now he has too short a period for the judges, right? Because he's going to count from the Exodus, the 480 years of first Kings chapter six, verse one, and the 480th year from the children of Israel coming out of of Egypt when they have come out of Egypt and he's going to count that not from the crossing of the Jordan when they come out of Egypt but the Exodus proper right so so he's going to have 40 years short for the judges from what we have and and Stephen has worked out in detail how the period of the judges would work and it would be very difficult to get rid of those 40 years I mean it could be done because Usher did it 
but it, it, it creates some problems. Okay. And especially with the spirit of prophecy statements. So, so we believe we have a more accurate an accounting of the period of the judges. Uh, Miller just added extra time. And again, Miller, like Usher, has, is looking for something that is, Miller didn't first come up with the 6,000 years ending in 1844 or 1843. He's just, he's first going to have the 2520 then, and then he's going to have the 2300 days and so forth. And so this is going to be something that he adds later to his arguments about the 6,000 years. Now, Samuel Snow is going to put it as the first thing. So it's his first argument. Now, he's not just arguing uh, that the end of the prophetic periods are in 1844, but he's going to be arguing that they're in the fall. Okay? So he's going to make uh, a mistake here in adding the 153 years, which is William Miller's error. And then he's going to have this misinterpretation like Miller did of Acts 13, verse 20, that people just read at face value rather than looking at, at uh, how it was translated. Now, is there any other points here? From the book of Judges, we obtain 430 years, and Josephus gives us 18 more for the elders in anarchy before any judge ruled. This added to 430 makes 448, which agrees with Paul. So, so he's going to deal with um, the division of the land of Canaan to the beginning of Samuel's administration. Stephen, do you notice anything here, if you're able to comment? Balance. Will this anything? So what about the 18 years that Josephus gives for the elders in anarchy before any judge ruled? Would you agree with that? I think it's maybe a bit more. Yeah, I would think so, too. And he's going to add this to the 430 years. So he takes the 430 years, adds this 18 years to get the 448. That's the way Miller does it. Um, and so he says about the space of 450 years is this 448 years. But we would know it have to be longer than that. If you add up the period of the kings of Israel, I yeah. think it comes to like so 256 years. Yeah. And maybe like six, seven months or something, seven or seven days, I think. Yeah. Um, but if you if you compare that with the actual period of from 977 to... to 723 or 721. Seven, yeah, to 721. Yeah. So that, that's uh, 250, is it 256 years? I think there's, there's like a... What did I say that the kings were add up to? You said it uh, was 256, but it's less. No, yeah, it is less. It's um, it's 241 years. Yeah, yeah. So, so they, they have, have this in periods where there's no king. So in doing that there, you have maybe, and it does seem to be quite near what Joseph is saying there, because that's maybe what, 14 years, 15 years. But with that there, you know, some of the reigns, the kings, uh, you have, you don't have any accession years. And it's kind of, I don't know. It's, uh, yeah, it's more, it's much more complex than just adding things up. Yes. Right. Right. Which, and, and there's some fudging done there to kind of make things fit. Right. So Miller does that. And, and Samuel Snow's just using that. And, and this wouldn't line up with statements in the spirit of prophecy regarding these periods and spans, right? Because you've shown that in your paper. Okay. Yeah, it's quite complicated. You have to sort of look at the reigns of the kings and, yeah, so. Yeah, and then he's dealing here with the beginning of Samuel's administration. Uh, so the division of land of Canaan to the beginning of Samuel's administration. And, and we would actually look more at the anointing of Saul, right, as that period. And so there's there's kind of fuzziness about, well, when does Samuel's administration begin? And how does that connect to, to, the, to the reigns of the kings of Judah uh, or the kings of United Israel, right? So there's lots of little details here that, that don't really fit. Now, then he's going to say... Um, from 4157, uh, 4156 years. So, 
So if you started 4157 BC, or in other words, 4156, and a fraction had passed at the supposed point of the birth of Christ. Well, when is Christ born? It's going to be in the fall, right? Oh. So I wouldn't put that a fraction has passed. You understand what I'm saying? That I'm, I'm not quite sure where he puts the creation of the world, whether he's counting it in the spring or whether he's counting it in the fall. So, so it's not clear exactly what he's saying there. Okay. So he, he's, he's just going to say that it's going to end sometime in the year 1844. He's not going to argue from the fall, but he could have said, you know, it was started in the fall of 4157 BC. So it should end in the fall of 1844, but he doesn't make that argument. Okay. Now he's going to deal with the seven times of the Gentiles. Now there are some arguments here about when Manasseh is taken captive. So he's going to argue that Manasseh is taken captive in the fall of 677. And it's possible, though it's not likely. We do know that when Manasseh is taken captive, according to Esser Hadon's prism, B, which which gives this account of all these uh, kings from Palestine and the sea coasts being carried uh, to Babylon and being sent out as slaves to haul timber to build his palace in Nineveh, that uh, they're going to haul this timber under difficult conditions. And the, so, so are those difficult conditions the heat of the summer or are they rain in the winter? Right. It's hard to know what what those difficult conditions are. So we can't say when Manasseh was taken captive, what time of the year. But he says it must have been autumn that Manasseh was taken captive. As proof of this, he uses Hosea uh, five, verse five. So in Hosea five, verse five, it says, uh, the pride of Israel doth testify to his face. Therefore, Israel and Ephraim shall fall in their iniquity and Judah shall fall with them. OK, so it doesn't say anything about this being in the fall, except that it uses the word fall. <laughs> I don't think that's what he means. And then Isaiah 7, verse 8, we're familiar with the 45 years. Shall Ephraim be broken, that it be not a people. Right. And then Isaiah uh, 10, verse 11 as well. So if we look at Isaiah 10, verse 11, it says, shall not I, shall I not, as I have done unto Samaria and unto her idols, do so do to Jerusalem and her, her idols. So is there anything that would indicate that this occurs in the fall? And he says, Hosea declares that Ephraim and Israel shall fall and that Judah shall also shall fall with them. Isaiah represents the king of Assyria as threatening to do to Jerusalem to Jerusalem as he had done to Samaria. Therefore, the final carrying away of the 10 tribes was before the invasion of Judah. And in the same year, the prophecy of Isaiah 7, verse 8, is correctly dated B.C. 742. 65 years from that brings us to B.C. 677. In that year was the final breaking of Ephraim, that it should not be a people. The history of this we find in 2 Kings 17. Kings did not go forth on their warlike expeditions in autumn or winter, but in spring or summer. Therefore, in the spring or summer of BC 677, S.R. Hayden and the Assyrians commenced removing the remnant of the ten tribes out of the cities of Samaria. And when they had accomplished this, they brought foreigners and placed them in their stead to inhabit those cities. Having performed this work, which necessarily occupied some months, they were then ready to invade Judah so that in the autumn of B.C. 677, they took the city of Jerusalem and bound her king with fetters and carried him to Babylon, right? And from that time, the 25, 20 years reached to the autumn of 18, 1844. Now, would we agree with this synopsis? So so there's, so do we, is uh, Ephraim, northern Israel, depopulated in 677? What I, what I seem to remember is not depopulated, but some of them were taken to Babylon. Is that right? And some were left. No. So, so what happens in, is Samaria is destroyed in 721, right? That is in 723, Hoshea is taken captive. And Shalmaneser just has him in prison. Shalmaneser V. 
And then when he dies in December or maybe January of uh, seven, so December of 722 or January of 721, Sargon II becomes king of Assyria. And it's Sargon that's going to put to death uh, Hoshea and also destroy Samaria. So Sargon V or Sar Sargon II does that. Shalmaneser V doesn't, you know, he's not there when the siege ends, right? He, he, he dies before that. So in 721, Samaria is going to be destroyed. And it would then, northern Israel would then be depopulated. What's going to happen in 677 is Esar Hadon is going to bring people that he has taken captive from other countries and repopulate northern Israel with these people that later become the Samaritans. So these are not people that are Babylonians. They're just people from different parts of the world of the Assyrian Empire that, that has conquered these different parts of the world and placed people in northern Israel. Now, there are going to be some Israelites still there, but it's it's until that time, it's it's pretty much desolate. So so the idea that that somehow Samaria is. And, and northern Israel, they're, they're going to be depopulated in 677 is not correct. Now, Ellen White, when she's going to quote Miller, she's going to quote from page 74 of Miller's memoirs. Well, she's going to quote all of these different prophecies that were fulfilled. And, but the one that she's not going to quote, that she's going to leave out, it's going to be just there with ellipses, is to replace it, is the six, 65 years for northern Israel. So Ellen White obviously didn't believe, and there's no other reason I could think that she she excises it. She doesn't believe that that was, is a correct application of this prophecy. So I would say here that what he's describing is what Miller describes, but it's incorrect. The 65 years are not for northern Israel. The 65 years are for Judah. Okay? So... So we can see here that even in this this timing of the 2520, that he, he's got some ideas that Ellen White would consider incorrect. Then we have the 2300 days. Now, uh, the problem here is going to be a, a number of things that uh, uh, that Snow. Well, first, he had some things really wrong in his first presentation that that was published on February 22nd in the Midnight Cry magazine. Uh, he's going to correct some of those mistakes here, right? So, um, and I'm not going to go through this in detail, but a lot of this has to do with, uh, that, that he does correct has to do with the decree of Artaxerxes, which originally he had Artaxerxes and Xerxes as the same person. Here he gets that correct. Now he says here, the decree embraces three grand objects, the building of the temple, well, maybe I'll go back a bit here. Uh, so he talks about the 70 weeks and the 2300 days. They must therefore commence together from verse 25. We learn that they begin at the going forth of the commandment or decree to restore and to build Jerusalem. The point of time from which to reckon must be either when the decree was first issued or when it was carried into execution. It could not be the former when it was first issued uh, because the, decrees embrace, the decree embraces all that was decreed by Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes, kings of Persia. See Isaiah. So we're not going to look at these verses, so we're familiar with those. The decree embraces three grand objects. The building of the temple, the restoring of the Jewish commonwealth, and the building of the street and wall. Now, does the decree of Artaxerxes have anything to do with the building of the temple? Like, in, in itself, just the decree itself? No, the temple has been built. So it's yes. more to do with decorations or yeah some some offerings and so forth for the temple so so things that are going to be used as utensils in the temple but but it doesn't address the building of the temple right now the restoring of the jewish commonwealth well we, we know that the decree is going to address uh uh basically the legal legal structure of a city so it's going to deal with uh the administrative functions that are then going to be given to the Jews uh, regarding the laws, right? And the execution of laws, the punishments and so forth. 
That's explicitly stated in Arctic Xerxes' decree. And it says, and the building of the street and wall. Well, that decree doesn't actually address the building of the street and wall per se. Uh, and, and that's going to happen under Arctic Xerxes' second decree, you know, in the 20th year of Arctic Xerxes, that the streets and walls are going to be built. Now, had the 70 weeks, which amount to 490 years, commence with the first issuing of the decree in BC 536, that is Cyrus's decree, they would have ended in BC 46. But 69 weeks were to extend to the manifestation of Messiah the Prince, and the 70th or last week covers the time of his crucifixion. We must, therefore, of necessity, reckon from the other point, that is, the promulgation and execution of the decree in Judah. From Ezra 7, verse 8 and 9, we learn that Ezra began to go up on the first day of the first month and arrived at Jerusalem on the first day of the fifth month in the seventh year of Arctic Xerxes, B.C. 457. Having arrived at Jerusalem, he appointed magistrates and judges and restored the Jewish commonwealth under the protection of the king of Persia, as he was fully authorized to do by the decree of Arctic Xerxes. This necessarily required some little time and brings us to the point when the restoring having been effected, the building of the street and the wall commenced. The 70 weeks are divided into three parts, seven weeks, 62 weeks, and one week. The connection shows that the seven weeks were allotted for the building of the streets and wall, which is not the, not correct, right? I mean, he, he's some of these are common ideas that we still have today that are wrong, because it's not really actually allotting seven weeks for the building of the streets and walls. It's just a misreading of the text. They therefore commenced when they began to build in the autumn of 457. From that point, 2300 years reached to the autumn of 1844. So again, he, there's just some problems with these details, which Ellen White would disagree with. Now, this is the bigger one dealing with the 70 weeks. Okay, so the 69 weeks extend to the manifestation of the Messiah. It has been thought by many that this was at his baptism, but this is a mistake. So where does the, the 69 weeks end? Is it at Christ's baptism? Is that where the 70th week begins? It is, yes. Yeah. He says that's a mistake. So does he agree with the spirit of prophecy here? And he does not. He does not, right. So, so I've pointed this out to people who try to argue about uh, the 6,000 years. And, and some will even take the position that, that, that snow is correct here. And Ellen White is wrong, right? Not really sure why they do that, right? It's much easier that parsimony would just suggest that Ellen White is correct and that just her endorsement of this message would not include all of the details of it. That would be much easier, right? Uh, it'd be fraught with less difficulty. But because they want to maintain this idea of the 6,000 years ending in 1844, they will actually deny the spirit of prophecy, even though they're trying to use the spirit of prophecy as an affirmation that this is true. So they have Ellen White contradicting herself. And that, of course, doesn't make sense. Um, now, he's going to go through in some detail trying to explain this. There um, in John 1, verse 19 to 34, there we learn that after the baptism of Christ, he was not known to the Jews as the Messiah. John says in verse 26, there standeth one among you, one among you who ye know not. So even though the word Messiah means to be anointed and Christ was anointed at his baptism, would it matter whether people recognized him as the Messiah or not? Is that even relevant? Now it says um, in verse 33 and 34, he declares that he knew him not till he saw the spirit descending and remaining on him at his baptism regarding John, right? So John didn't even know, but he did at the baptism which was previous to him, to his giving this testimony. This testimony, There's no proof that anyone save John saw the Spirit descend, thus descending. And this proof, therefore, that Jesus was the Messiah was given to none but John, unless it was given to others in John's testimony. But the testimony of John was not sufficient fully to establish that point. Does that even make sense? And then he's going to argue, well, you sent unto John, and he bear witness unto the truth, but I receive not the testimony from man. In verse 36, Christ says, but I have greater witness, witness than that of John for the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. 
So he then says the miracles of Christ proved him to be the Messiah. But even his own testimony without those miracles was not sufficient to establish the point, as is, ev as it, as is evidence from verse 31. If I bear witness in myself, my witness is not true. The miracles of Christ publicly wrought did not commence till after John was put in prison. The prophecy of Daniel 9.25 concerning the 69 weeks was intended for the whole Jewish nation, and they were condemned because they understood it not. In Luke 19, verse 34, 33 and 34, we find our Lord denouncing upon them the most awful judgments because they knew not the time of their visitation. The prophecy was plain, and they should have heeded it. Our Savior also told them plainly when the period ended, saying, the time is fulfilled. Mark 1, 14 and 15, Matthew 4, verse 12, etc. Thus we see that the 69 weeks ended and the 70th week began soon after John's imprisonment. John began his ministry in the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar. Uh, see Luke 3, verse 1 to 3. The administration of Tiberius began according to the United Testimony of Chronologers in August of AD 12. 14 years from that point extended to August AD 26 when his 15th year began. Uh, the ministry of John therefore commenced in the latter part of AD 26. From Luke 3, verse 21, we learn that after John had been baptized and for some time, Jesus came and was baptized. And verse 23 informs us that at that time, he was not far from 30 years of age. It is astronomically proved that our Savior was born four years before the Christian era. This proof, the proof is this, right? He's going to go into uh, some of these proofs. Thus being the first Passover after the beginning of John's baptism must have been in the spring of AD 27. After this, Jesus had interview with Nicodemus and taught him concerning regeneration, right? So then he's going to say this necessarily brings us down to the summer of the autumn of AD 27, but John was not yet cast in prison. We are therefore compelled to place the point of time at which Jesus began the proclamation of the gospel in Galilee in the autumn of AD 27. Here ended the 69 weeks. So we can all argue that this is wrong. Right, easily show that this is incorrect. So, so again, we can see that Ellen White has endorsed this midnight cry, and those that are the most spiritual receive it. Samuel Snow is going to be one of those, right? And he's going to publish this midnight cry, this midnight cry that empowered uh, the second angel's message. And yet, we can see it's not without fault, right? Can I? Can I mean it, it's pretty clear. I mean. So we would have to either argue that she didn't really endorse this, but yet some of the same people who accept Smith's, the endorsement, endorsement of Smith's thoughts on Daniel are the same people that uh, accept the endorsement of this page, this article as both by Ellen White saying that both must be correct. And of course, my view is probably they haven't really spent the time looking at the details of Snow's arguments, right? But some have, and they've just, they, they can keep two different conflicting beliefs in their mind at the same time and, and not see a problem with it. So I don't know if it's a problem of logic or just stubbornness or whatever it is. I can't tell you what motivates people to, to do that. But I can say it's quite clear that Ellen White is not endorsing every detail of this article. Now, the thing that's going to be uh, powerful about this is the fact that Snow's for the first time in the Advent movement going to clearly show that Christ is crucified in the midst of the week. Right. He says, we are therefore compelled to place the point of time in which Jesus began the proclamation of the gospel in Galilee in the autumn of 27 A.D. Here ended the 69 weeks, and here began the week during which the covenant was confirmed. In the midst of the week, Jesus caused the sacrifice and oblation to cease by offering himself as a lamb without spot to go from the cross. The Hebrew word translated midst is by the lexicon defined half, half part, middle, midst. The week is divided into two halves, and the event was thus to divide it was the death of Christ. This event took place, according to Dr. Hales, one of the ablest and best chronologers, in the spring of AD 31. 
Ferguson has placed it as in AD 33, but in order to prove it, he assumes the rabbinical mode of reckoning the year, which is not correct. They commence the year with the new moon in March, but the Karaites with the new moon in April. And the word Karaite signifies one perfect in the law. These accuse the rabbins of having departed from the law and conformed to the customs of the heathen. The charge is just as they regulate their year by the vernal equinox in imitation of the Romans, whereas the law says nothing about the vernal equinox, but required on the 16th day of the first month, the offering of the first fruits of the barley harvest. But if the year be commenced according to the rabbins with the new moon in March, the barley harvest could not possibly be ripe, ripe in 16 days from that time. Care rights are therefore undoubtedly correct. Now our Lord was crucified on the day of the Passover. It is evident from John um, 18 verse 28. It is likewise the day before the Sabbath, as is proved in John 19 verse 31. According to the rabbinical reckoning, the Passover occurred on the day before the Sabbath in AD 33, and not for several years before and after. But according to the Karaite reckoning, the Passover occurred on that day in AD 31. Therefore, that was the year of the crucifixion. The covenant was confirmed half a week by Christ and the other half by his apostles. Okay, so there's a number of mistakes here which have been passed on. You won't find these in the spirit of prophecy, but you will find them in, in, in many other writings. So there's the assumption that uh, the Karaites always commenced the year one month later than the Jews, than the rabbis. So that the Karaite Jews always began with the new moon in April. Now, this is not correct. Now, it also says that the Bible never mentions the spring equinox, and that's also not correct, right? Obviously, it never calls it the vernal equinox or the spring equinox or even the equinox, but it talks about the return of the year. And the return of the year refers to the equinox. It's just the Hebrew way of describing it, right? And, and so it's the new moon connected to the vernal equinox that actually determines the start of the year. Okay, so so there's lots of little things in here, little details that we would we would we could show that are not correct in in his analysis here. But could Samuel Snow have gotten all of these things right in in 1844? I don't think he had the access to the information. Right. And and some of the information that he had was incorrect. <laughs> So God, in his providence, gave him information and led him to the truth, even though some of the information he had was false. So we know one of the things that he had that was false was uh, this article that was published in some of the, the, the papers of the day dealing with, you know, the death decree of, of Christ, right? So Pilate's death decree which was just a fake document that was published in, in newspapers, you know, for its sensational content. It's kind of like stuff, you, you know, the newspapers of the day were very similar to the face, Facebook today in uh, the social media and in, in how uh, the types of things that were published, all kinds of speculative and sensational stories that are sometimes very loosely based in reality, sometimes not based in reality at all. But uh they did help sell newspapers, which, of course, sold advertising. So it's pretty similar. Um, but you think about the time frame in which he had to operate. So, so he didn't have the Internet. He didn't have access to the libraries that we have. He would have had very limited access to books that we have. Well, uh, the yeah. scripture that comes to mind is man makes his plans but god directs his paths okay yeah so so god directed him but there's it doesn't mean that he's going to get things correct that he has no way that he could god's not going to just magically give him knowledge of of you know how the calendars work and 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 proper dates right you, you understand what i'm saying like he's going to use what he has to work with but he's still going to direct the person correctly so that he's going to come to the correct conclusions, the important conclusions. And that is that the 2300 days are going to end in the fall on the 10th day of the seventh month. 
1844. Now, I, I puzzled over this quite a bit, you know, because one of the arguments that people bring against Adventism is we got the wrong date, right? That it should have been like September 23rd, 1844, because that's what the Karaites and the rabbis both had in 1844. And we can tell this because of Karaites, um tombstones, right? So they're going to have double dated. They're going to have, you know, the dates of, uh, of, of when the person died based upon both the calendar that they're using, the, whether it's a rabbinic calendar or a Karaite calendar, and also the date on our calendars, right? And so when they look at these Karaite cemeteries in 1844, uh, you can see clearly that they did not begin the first day of the first month on April 19th. It was March 21st in 1844. So there's there's just zero evidence that Karaites actually ever could, and they never could start the year as late as April 19th. Never happens. That would be way too late according to how the Karaites do things, right? So, and, and, and the latest you can get it is like April 20th. And that's the latest you can have a year begin if you use the spring equinox or so the first new moon after the spring equinox. So, so anyway, it, it, it seems quite clear here that, you know, there's some problems with how he's, he's looking at, at these calendars, his, his appeal to hail. Um, there's some problems with that on how that was done. I've tried to figure out how he got that from hail. Um, doesn't appear to be correct. So I actually think Hale has uh, 30 AD. And uh, I think it's just that he's using a, uh, he's doing something different. I'm not really sure how he got 31, but I could be wrong about that. But I have read Hale's paper and tried to figure it out. And I don't think he has 31. I think he has 30 AD. So, but anyway, uh, I could be wrong on that. But but obviously he doesn't have all the information we have. So he has this period of time. He's going to correct quite a few mistakes between his first publication from February 22nd to August. And and if he had the resources that we had, he he would have been he would not have made some of these mistakes. But Ellen White is not endorsing every detail of what was given. And, and there's no reason to assume then that she's endorsing every detail of Uriah Smith's thoughts on Daniel. When overall, thoughts on Daniel and Revelation, it's a good book. It's going to point us to the correct understanding of, of the prophetic periods as understood by the church and proclaimed by the church in that period of time. Now, there's some other things which are really important. The types, which is one of the main reasons why he ended up uh, uh, even coming to the conclusion of the fall. And without this work that was done by Snow, uh, we wouldn't have had a good explanation of the disappointment in October 22nd, 1844. So there's um, reasons why this, this is important that has nothing to do with the little details that are missed. Now, we can also look at a parallel to, to Samuel Snow and to this movement, right? So we don't always get everything right, but we can still be led of God. And, and that's a problem for some people. They think, well, we must. Mm -hmm. so, and we need to understand the difference between a principle that's being used and a detail and a misapplication of something. Yeah, Kelly? I was just saying, amen, that we can get things wrong, but God can still direct our path. And mm -hmm. definitely, definitely in my life. Yeah, and, and, and we need to know, we need to, we need to recognize God's leading and not get confused between God's leading and our mistakes. Our mistakes don't deny God's leading. Our lack the of understanding. The indications of his providence to be recognized, to be able to have the spiritual eyesight, the eye salve of the word of God. Mm -hmm helps us to, to recognize those leadings, to see his hand, to see his hand by faith. So, so when I look at what happened in July 18th, 
what I see is God was leading us and, and he was correcting us as we moved along. And so we, we can't deny God's leading, even, even if we made mistakes. But the, the greater mistake would be to say, well, God wasn't actually leading us because we made mistakes. And so then to say that Satan must have been leading us. Right. And, and we can see that the direct parallel uh, to the great disappointment. Right. Mm-hmm. So if we understand the light of the midnight cry has been guiding us all along from Millerite history, then we can see how God can lead and correct us as we move through history. And just because we make mistakes doesn't mean we then say, oh, you know, God well, obviously is leading us. Yeah. It's, it's pretty key that that you had sent information for Jeff to review and, and that he didn't for one reason or another, whatever they are. But I see God's providence or his hand over it in that as well. And yeah. the other thing is to call light darkness. How great is that darkness? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, 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 to me, it seems impossible to ignore the light that God has given us. Now, but, but it doesn't mean that we were, weren't without mistakes. Or it doesn't mean that, yeah, we, yeah, it doesn't mean we were faultless in, in all, everything that we, we taught or understood. But God Regarding often July. gives us, gives us ways that we can look back and see that he was trying to show us that we were in error in certain areas. Mm-hmm. Right. Looking back. Then, yeah. And then we can also see his purposes in those errors, right? Amen. His his providence, just as with the Millerites, when they, you know, God was, his hand was over and hid a mistake in some of the figures, right? Now, it's not like God's intentionally trying to deceive them, but the reality was, yeah. because it is connected with them themselves, that God is in his care, not showing them something before they need to see it, Right. It wouldn't have, Some of the, it wouldn't have benefited them. There's, there's, in looking back, we mm-hmm. can see so many, so many things that occurred around July 18 that couldn't have been orchestrated other than by God, like the money being paid for the ad, the ad getting past the editor and being published. That was any editor would have right away picked up that that would be quite offensive to Islam and not let it go out to print. Oh, maybe maybe he sort of agreed with it or something. <laughs> no, no, it, it got by because he was on holiday or something. I can't remember exactly oh, really? the reasons. Uh, okay. Um, because it was an uh, assistant editor or something that was, who knows, overwhelmed. He was just looking at the $70,000, I think it was, for the ad. <laughs> That's what he was thinking about. Okay, yeah, sure, print it. And yeah. then that money being doubled because it was given back, and then that money was matched and donated to the Islamic Foundation of some kind yeah. as a as an apology, and then, and then it being picked up by papers around the world yeah. for free. It went around the world. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. so we could see things the didn't problems. happen by man. No. Yeah. The other thing to me that is kind of uh, you know, when we think about Jeff's prediction regarding the pandemic and how that came between these two way marks that he initially said between midnight and midnight cry, and then we end up with the date of November 19th and July 18th, and the pandemic happens between those dates, right? You know, so there, you know, so you're going to have the pandemic starting around in November of 2019, right? And, and just all these other things that happen. So, you know, so anyway, to sort of sum this all up, because uh, we're, we're sort of running out of time here. But uh, we've looked at Daniel's last vision. I don't know if we should do a summary of it in another study or whether this is sufficient here at this point, because we don't have any more material to look at. Is, is there any suggestions about this study? But what we should do, maybe maybe we can just deal with it on Sunday um, or maybe tomorrow night or something. But but I'm out of material. 
on Daniel's last vision. I, I mean, I'm writing a paper on it. But uh, any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Okay, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study this morning. And we ask for your continued a presence in our lives and the decisions that we make. We pray for one another. Lord, you know all things before they happen and you know the purposes of everything. Help us yield our lives to you and that you can uh, work, that we can allow you to work the work that you want to do in us, that we can be a blessing to the world. And we want to receive your blessing as well. We need your presence in our lives. We need your encouragement and your strength. We pray for those who are searching for truth, that you can lead them and guide them. Bring us together again to study. We pray for the study tomorrow night and studies that we will continue to have. And we pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.